Hello everyone and welcome to conversations about Europe. Uh, today's subject is the future of Europe. I thought I would begin, first of all, uh, I actually apologize um, that um, Mr. Tonino Fitzula could not come. He is ill, he, he got a flu, he apologizes and hopes to join us in some future, at some future occasion. Um, I thought I'd begin by saying an Irish historian, a Greek political scientist, and a Croatian politician walk into a business school. <laughs> sounds, sounds, like a beginning of a, sounds like a beginning of a joke. Um, but it isn't. It, it's not really a joke. It's a, um, this group of people here has um, quite a bit to say about the future of Europe. I trust you've seen their impressive biographies and the invitation for this event. Um, so I won't really dwell on that. Um, really quickly, Professor Sims is my Cambridge colleague. He's a professor of the history of international relations um, and a fellow of Peterhouse College. Um, you will likely, within a year or so, have an opportunity to read the Croatian translation of his newest book um, about Europe uh, since the mid 15th century to today. Um, um, over there on the left is Professor Lukas Sukalis. He's a professor um, of political science um, at the University of Athens and also the chair of Eliane, the Hellenic Foundation for uh, European and uh, International Affairs. Um, and um, next to me is, of course, Mr. Andrei Blankovic, the newly elected member of European Parliament from Croatia, from the um, ranks of the Croatian Democratic Union. Um, I will try to keep the conversation to today um, both current and forward-looking as much as possible. We will try to, I thought it would be a good contrast to see how European um, academics, thinkers about uh, European future, interact with Croatian policymakers. Um, maybe to test whether Croatian policymakers are actually even thinking about the future of Europe and what their position is. Um, so um, we will have about 45 minutes or so where we will interact here on a number of topics and then we will open the floor to your questions. Um, and I thought that perhaps the best way to start would be with Professor Tsukalis, who you have said um, that we are lacking a, a common European narrative um, and a, a common European interpretation of the crisis. Um, that we have, if we can call them so, a, a sort of a northern creditor and, and a southern debtor interpretation of, of the crisis. And that we also are lacking a common European narrative here. Um, do we need that common narrative to sort of move forward? And, and what might be that sort of sensible interpretation of, of the crisis that we're currently in? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to the hosts and for the opportunity to share some views with members of the panel and with all of you. Now, let me start by repeating the obvious, namely that Europe is going through an almighty crisis. So, Croatians, welcome to the crisis. Uh, it is the worst crisis, I'm convinced, since the very beginning of European integration. Interestingly enough, it is a crisis that originated in the United States, but it was the result of the bursting of the biggest financial bubble since 1929. But it soon acquired a strong European dimension and that was around the end of 2009, beginning of 2010. And the reason that the international crisis became a European crisis is, if I had to put it in very simple terms, is that we in Europe, or more precisely, we 17 members of the Eurozone, happen to have a currency without a state. And that is a contradiction that becomes acute in times of crisis. Since then, the last three years, 
many unthinkables have become reality. I mean, we have done many things at the Eurozone level that if anybody had told you would happen three years ago, your answer would be that you're mad. There's been a series of bailouts of uh, sovereigns. There's been massive interventions by the European Central Bank. There have been changes in the coordination of national economic policies that take us into a new uncharted, uncharted territory in terms of shared sovereignty. We have created firewalls and new mechanisms to deal with the crisis. All those unthinkables have happened. Unfortunately, they have usually come late. They have not been well implemented, and they are not enough. So the crisis goes on, although there's big progress. I mean, most people are now convinced inside and outside the Eurozone that the Euro is going to survive and that members of the Eurozone are not going to leave, which is very different from the perception that was prevailing only about a year ago. Yet there are many things that need to be done. Uh, if again I were to give the answer in slogan terms, I would say that if a large part of the problem is that we have a currency without a state, then the question is whether we are going to end up with some kind of state or whether we are going to lose the currency. So that is simplifying considerably the challenge facing the 17 members of the Eurozone soon to become 18. Uh, why has it been so difficult to deal with it, and I will enumerate two or three reasons, and I will come back to the specific question asked by our chair. It's been difficult to deal with the crisis, first of all, because the size of the problem is huge. There's nothing to do with previous crises, right? The amounts of money that we are talking about are multiples of annual EU budgets. So it's not peanuts. It's large sums. That's number one. Number two is that the European crisis is lived through in very different ways in different parts of Europe. The Germans have a very different perception of the crisis, a different one, the Irish, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Greeks. And the trouble is that this economic divergence that has grown inside Europe, largely as a result of the crisis, is coupled with a political development, and the combination of the two is explosive. What is the political development? This is the growth of populism all over Europe, in individual European countries. So if you marry uh, economic divergence with national populism, you end up with a big bomb in your hand. So that explains the difficulty. And our chairman asked about north-south perceptions. Of course, I mean, there has developed a split, a divide, a north-south divide in Europe, which is a relatively recent and dangerous phenomenon. And unless this is dealt with adequately, we are going to be in deep trouble. And then there's a third reason, and I hope I'll have the opportunity to come back to this question later. Then there's a third reason why it's so difficult to deal with the crisis. And I would put it very bluntly, it doesn't sound politically correct. But the most difficult problem of all is that the crisis leaves us with a big bill to be paid. The key question, political question, is who pays the bill? and who pays the bill within countries and between countries in Europe. But that's the most difficult question of all. When you come in political economy to the question is who pays, you have really come to dangerous territory. And that's where we are today. So I'd better stop at this point. Thank you. Um, and when it comes to this question of whether we have
currency with a state, or whether we lose a currency. Uh, you, Professor Sims, have a clear, uh, if radical or let's call it revolutionary proposal on, on how to get there. And you have a clear idea that indeed we need currency with, uh, with a new state. Um, you suggest that the gradualist interpretation uh, of European integration has been proven as a fallacy, that we need a big bang um, in European integration. Um, now, when you look around Europe today, where do you see the forces that could really be ready to, to actually implement that? Well, thank, thank you very much uh, for that. So I'd like to also uh, say how pleased I am to be here. I'm very grateful for the invitation. Um, grateful to uh, Jerry Novo for the hosting this, to Josef for inviting me as well. Um, and so then I'll try and answer your, your question. But perhaps I could do so a little bit obliquely and explain why it is as a historian that I believe that Big Bang solutions are actually what is required. Because it seems to me what I can provide this afternoon is a little bit of value added um, in the sense that the future of Europe um, it is obviously influenced by the past of Europe. And it seems to me that there are two uh, different, dif differing constitutional models in European history. As part of European history, I regard also the history of the United States, which is an outgrowth of European history. Um, and these two models are, on the one hand, the uh, rather loose confederal model of the old Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. So that was the, basically how Central Europe was ordered for hundreds of years until 1806. Um, and that's a very decentralized uh, model. It's a model with a weak emperor, a weak um, parliament, um, very rules-based, very legalistic. You can see what I'm getting at. <laughs> this is, uh, if you like, the um, uh, historical uh, um, origin, the, the predecessor, the forerunner of the European Union. And many of the things that we find so exasperating or inadequate about the European Union come from that tradition of slow decision making, sometimes no decision making, uh, decisions taken but not implemented. Um, that's the history of the Holy Roman Empire. That is to a certain extent also where, as we're German, one strand of German political culture is coming from. Um, and that ends in disaster in 1806 when the Holy Roman Empire uh, is swallowed up uh, by the revolutionary French and their allies. The alternative model, and this is what uh, um, was, was driving it, is the Anglo-American model of constitutional structure. And that is based from the late 17th century on the idea of a very close link between representation, taxation, and debt. In other words, what the English solve, borrowing a little bit from the Dutch in the late 17th century, is the problem of how to deal with the public debt, the way you deal with public debt is the public debt must be owned by the entire <coughs> political nation as represented in Parliament. Now, of course, over time, the political nation expands, starts off just being property owners. But generally speaking, the idea is the nation owns the debt and is responsible for it. And this model uh, is developed in the struggle against Bourbon France. Uh, it leads then in 1707 to the Act of Union with Scotland, which despite what you might read in the papers from time to time, it's still one of the most successful uh, unions historically. And it's the model which is adopted by the 13 colonies, or the 13 new states, after independence from Great Britain in 1783. And when they sit down to design their new state, they say, and this is very interesting, people like Alexander Hamilton, uh, Madison, um, John Jay, the, the founding fathers of the American Constitution, uh, say we don't want to be like the Germans. We, specifically, they say we don't want to be like the Holy Roman Empire. We want to be like Great Britain. And they build up a similar uh, system, albeit with a presidency, uh, senate, and so on. And the point is that debt is owned by uh, the political nation as represented in Congress. And this then makes possible the solution of the huge debts that have been accumulated by the uh, Americans in the course of the War of Independence. Now, what I argue is that what we need in Europe today is to get away from the tradition of the Holy Roman Empire, which is the idea of just 
emphasis on the process, on the legality, on slow decisions or no decisions, and decisions that are not properly implemented, and the idea that we move only through a very long process towards unity. But we should rather accept the lesson from history, which is that successful unions are not processes, but events. Obviously, there are certain details in the American case that are worked out later on, but in principle, union takes place in one event in the Constitutional Convention of 1787 years. And my argument would be that the only solution to the current Eurozone crisis is something similar to uh, the US or the British solution, which is a Constitutional Convention uh, representing the entire Eurozone or aspirant Eurozone population, which would then uh, draw up a constitution which would be similar to that of the United States, with a Senate, uh, House of Citizens representing population and so on. And that uh, parliamentary system would then own the public debt. And that is the only solution that will actually persuade the money markets that their money is safe and will safeguard the currency. So, in a word, uh, union and the solution to the problem has to be an event rather than a process. Well, um, let's confront that idea with political reality. Um, but judging by the electoral program of um, the HTZ for the European elections, um, the program which, among other things, I guess, partly helped you win those elections five weeks ago, and these ideas probably don't really sit very well with you, or at least with the program of your party. Your program stated that the European Union is not and must not become the negation of the national states, um, but a framework for the development of all of its member states in today's globalized economy. Um, and that this is the policy of the HDZ and the European People's Party. So, how do you confront this, this idea that if we are to save the currency, we need to stay? First of all, thank you for the invitation to participate in another very interesting event at the Zagreb School of Economics and Management, and I thank you as the host and also to Dean, Professor Nyabra, I also greet uh, Minister Mitas uh, Chodak, with whom I worked a lot on the Croatian European perspectives a few years ago, let's put it that way. Uh, I believe that uh, you outlined only a part of, of the program that the HDZ uh, had uh, prepared for the ad hoc elections that we just had a month ago, and I greet my colleague from the list, Mr. Kershaw and Boimov, so there are actually two of us having that uh, project, at least as candidates. I don't think it is the matter of confronting uh, the Professor Sims with the HDZ uh, political project, because you have to understand that we have uh, drafted our program based on the wider political platform of the European People's Party, as well as on the most recent document adopted at the Congress in Bucharest, which was only eight months ago. Of course, uh, it perhaps helped us to win, because I think it is an important message, especially in the times of crisis, to send the message to tell that the nation states are not over. Uh, the European governance is certainly a multi-level governance, and this is something we all, we all feel, we all share, and therefore, uh, when you see the recent opinion polls and the fall of confidence into the European project, uh, basically uh, unraveling in the streets of, of a number of member states in recent years, it requires also solid nation-state structures. I think uh, this is not a statement that I would not believe in the European project as it is, but I am more of the opinion that actually it is a process rather than a big bang. Perhaps in the crisis, the Big Bang sounds like a good solution, but when you look at the history of Europe, we all see that in more than the last six decades, it was much more of a process. And uh, whenever the process was sort of stopped, we felt the crisis. Of course, this one is an unprecedented one. It was not created by the member states of the European Union. Its origin was across the Atlant Atlantic, but the contagion went on, and we saw that a number of uh, European economies were not actually neither competitive enough, neither did they have solid public finances, and therefore they became swiftly vulnerable. Uh, so the efforts that we have been witnessing on the European level in the course of the last five years, but also moreover, I think, on the level of the, of the G20, because you saw that when the crisis erupted, G8 quickly 
transformed in the G20. I think for the global governance, that is perhaps the address where the first steps are taken, where, where the initial decisions are done, and then they become part of the decision-making process in other fora. And that is also uh, typical for the activities within the European Council. Uh, I think that Croatia as a newcomer, especially in this first year of our membership, which only will be actually six months, and then it's the elected year for the, for the whole uh, 28 member states, we will be actually just coming in as someone who needs to understand the pipeline for the many of the decisions which have been prepared. I think uh, even though everybody thought in Europe that uh, the constitution for Europe was going to be there for a long time, that we would stop thinking about the institutional architecture and this sort of perennial debate of how shall we adopt the structures to enlarge the European Union. It, the debate will come back faster to us than we thought. And uh, it is true that Europe needs a new narrative, it needs a new inspiration, it needs a new, um, I would say, attractiveness. I can tell you that because I did a lot of uh, political pedagogy around Croatia in the last three years. And I have to admit that the story of reconciliation after the Second World War, the solidarity, the step-by-step, -step, the new functionalist approach, it's not actually clicking well with the, with the large majority of the population, especially about the young generations, because they can't adequately relate with this historic achievement of, of the European project which is actually peace and reconciliation in the continent, married with the economic, unparalleled economic prosperity in, in, in historic terms. So therefore, I think we will all be actually seeking for a new narrative, and it will be a matter of, uh, of political angle, political nuance, political profile, whose problem for the first time in pan-European elections in the sense that we would all be putting forward a candidate to become president. This is, this is going to be a huge novelty. Therefore, I think that the last elections in Croatia, which we have on the floor of the paper, will be uh, quickly behind us, and we shall be facing a very new uh, scenography for the European elections next year. Because not only the Croatian candidates will be the actors, and it will be mu much more a political uh, competition among the European political. So, from the Croatian point of view, we, at least in the HDZ, we really strongly believe in the European project, but we also feel that the nation states can contribute to that exercise. I think with the fact that we have now a legal personality of the European Union, something we've been sort of looking for for decades and was addressed by the Lisbon Treaty, is a big step forward. And in terms of the economic supervision and the coordination of economic policies, I think Croatia also, as a newcomer and formally being included in the European semester, is going to very quickly learn uh, what are the mechanisms that can alleviate certain uh, efforts in structural reforms, in budgetary discipline, in fiscal policy, and in all other efforts to consolidate state policies in the context of the crisis. Well, you seem to be, I think our audience is now clear that there is, there is a tension here between the, the, the two different interpretations of of the needed way forward. Um, but I guess it took us three questions to get to the question of democracy or democ democratic legitimacy. Um, last week, a uh, Pew Research Center came out with a new study uh, titled, I think, The New, the new Sick Man of Europe, uh, with some very interesting numbers on, on the democratic legitimacy of the European Union um, amongst its citizens, which perhaps gets at, at, the, at the unanswered question of where would these popular vo voices come to, to form this new, uh, stronger core, uh, Eurozone state? Um, apparently only 28% of the Europeans believe that economic integration actually strengthen the national economies. The numbers are very different. They go from 54% in Germany uh, to only, obviously, 11% in Greece, 11% in Italy, and only 22% in France, for example. Um, interestingly, a uh, favorable view of the EU, about 45%. 60% of Germans, only 33% of the Greeks, 43% in the UK. Um, what seems interesting, uh, particularly uh, in light of a uh, recent pronouncement out of Paris, is that the French are being pulled apart from the Germans, and they are starting to look more like the rest of Southern Europe. 
um, and the Germans, of course, are being pulled away from everyone else. 77% um, of the French believe economic integration weakened the economy. 91% of the French believe their economy is bad. 25% uh, of Germans. Um, so it seems that the economic foundations of the project, the original foundations for the project, seem to be faltering. It seems that your idea that um, Europe of nations is still um, the way forward and, and that the gradual approach is uh, uh, lessons of the gradual approach of the past few decades are still valid. Um, it seems to be resonating with the voters. It seems to be the case that that is what the voters believe. Now, um, Professor Tsukal, in your writings, you write of the so-called um, elitist conspiracy behind the, uh, behind the project of European integration. And you're saying that this elitist conspiracy is, is being remobilized for the good old cause. Now, can you reflect a little bit on this, and on this question of, of, of democratic legitimacy, and if it is the fact that we will need the state to save the currency, where is this democratic legitimacy going to come from? Okay, uh, first of all, in arguing for long that European integration has been the result of an elitist conspiracy that added with good intentions and pretty remarkable results so far. And this was relying for decades on some kind of permissive consensus of societies. And in our societies were not mobilized for the project. It was all a matter of small numbers. But the rest followed because European integration for decades was identified with good things and with rising prosperity. So societies were ready to give their leaders a kind of carte blanche to proceed with further integration as long as the goods were delivered. Now, the problems start, in fact, before the financial crisis because one reason, I think, is that as European integration deepens and widens, permissive consensus can no longer be taken because it affects your everyday life. And then the question is not whether you are in favor of more Europe or less Europe, but whether you are in favor of this particular kind of Europe or that particular kind of Europe. And that's a totally different question. And that's, I think, where we have been for some like, like 30 years ago. Now, what the crisis has done is that it has increasingly transformed European integration in the eyes of citizens increasingly into a kind of zero-sum game. The Northerners, Germans, Austrians, Finns, Dutch and others, increasingly perceive European integration as a kind of transfer union where their money goes into a bottomless pit to support the sort of irresponsible Southerners. And in the eyes of the Southerners, the European Union is increasingly is identified as the policeman of austerity. So the policeman of bad things. Now, if you continue along those lines, there's going to be an explosion, and we are very close to this program, and that's why you have those numbers. So the key question is whether you can redesign, perhaps look for a new narrative that tries to marry the concerns of the Germans the Irish, the Portuguese, and the Greeks. And that's not easy. But I think it is inevitable that a new narrative will imply, in many ways, more integration. Now, are our societies ready for it? And if I were again to use a slogan, term, we are in a situation in which economics dictates and politics denies. I mean, we know what we need to satisfy the markets. The question is, can we carry the citizens along with you? And it's not obvious. So, you need a kind of new European narrative, both to satisfy the fears of the Germans and the fears of the Greeks. If you do not produce that narrative, you're in deep trouble. And that's where we are today. So, if the people are not in favor of greater integration, it seems that they're not. Um, 
why should we push for it? Uh, Professor Sims, you think that if the EU by some chance fell apart, all bets would be off. Could you play out that scenario from a historical perspective? Well, I, th I think the, the most obvious scenario would be either the famous Brexit, um, some form of, of Greek exit with some uh, knock-on effect along the Mediterranean periphery uh, exits in Italy and Spain and Portugal as uh, um, uh, holders of death became nervous. Or you could have, and for you in, uh, in the, as it were, the post-Yugoslav space, um, the phenomenon of central secession is something you should think about. I and mean, essentially, Serbia bailed out uh, Yugoslavia um, in the 1980s. And you could see a scenario where Germany did the same uh, in the next few years. Um, I happen to think that's extremely unlikely. Um, and I actually don't accept the idea that populations are necessarily against this deeper integration. And I shall tell you why. Um, first of all, even in Germany, where uh, the sense of attachment to the, to the former currency, the Deutsche Mark, is the strongest, uh, and where you have you know, new parties like uh, um, Alternative für Deutschland, who are calling for a Deutsche Mark, a recent poll in the last three weeks showed more than 70% of the population wanting to hold on to the euro and not to go back uh, uh, to the uh, Deutsche Mark. Um, and I think the important thing to remember is that although the populations who are represented in these Eurosceptic polls are clearly very upset with the current state of European uh, politics, they trust their own politics even less. That's my sense. So I'm, I'm from Ireland, and um, a few, uh, about a year ago, I wrote an article, uh, co-wrote an article, advocating this very solution. And it was, very, and it was widely discussed in uh, newspapers and uh, television and so on. And every single one of the commentators, every single one of the politicians said, we need something like this union solution. Um, and when they were asked, does this mean the Irish state has failed? They said, yeah, the Irish state has failed. If the Irish state hadn't failed, if they hadn't run up such enormous uh, uh, bank uh, debt or taken on such a bank debt, we wouldn't be sitting here. So the paradox we're faced with, I think, is that European populations know perfectly well that some such union solution is necessary and is preferable to the national politics that went before. If they didn't think that, the Greeks could bail out tomorrow. They could say, we want to go back to the government, we want to be independent, and so on. Maybe they will do that. All I can say is that the vast majority of European populations won't do that. The problem they face is that we have, um, at the moment, the, European, the Eurozone Union, which is made up of, uh, made up of democracies, but it is not itself a democracy. It's a strange body. So it'd be rather like as if the United States um, was run by uh, a committee of individual state electors rather than having a central representation. And the result of this is not the strength of the national state, uh, actually, um, Mr. Benkovich, but it's actually the, the strength of certain national states, which are then, as a result, overrepresented even more than their population within the fates of the Union. So in other words, a vote, a German vote now counts more than the individual vote of most other Euro Eurozone uh, populations. So that's, that's the problem we face, and the only way you can solve it is if you have a democratic buy-in at the centre. And what the Germans then demand in return, perfectly reasonably, is a guarantee that, not new, that new debts won't be run up, and that in turn requires the end of all the individual sovereignties. So that, that, you know, that sort of summarizes the issue, but I don't think the populations wouldn't accept that solution if they are actually offered it. That's my answer. Well, as soon as you start talking about the democracy of one person, one vote, it sort of reminds us of all the conversations we had some 20, 25 years ago around here. Um, so where would Croatia be on all that? How do you perceive these discussions um, that we should have uh, a system like this? And, and related to that, um, it seems that we were just faced with the, with the choice of whether to get into the EU or not. And it seems that very soon, reasonably soon, five, ten years down the road, we will be faced with another European integration choice of whether to get into the Eurozone or not. Um, if we are moving towards a two speed Do you have a choice? A clarification. Do you have a choice on the Euro? Because... Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, the economic level, do we just think we have a choice? 
So could you reflect on that, on that choice that we will possibly have? First, uh, a legal point. As, as a lawyer and also someone who has uh, read very much the accession treaty, and I think most of the audience knows, when you join the European today, yeah. you can't join the card. Right. The fact is actually that it is an exemption to the rule that we are not immediately part of the Eurozone, but we have agreed to become part of the Eurozone already in the accession negotiations. It is only the matter of time when Croatia will fulfill the criteria. So the choice, legally the choice is already behind us, uh, economically it is a matter of time. And that is, that is where, we are, where we are today and that is not only the case for Croatia but for everybody else basically. When you negotiate accession, what you negotiate is how to adapt your legislation to the EPP and have some position periods for some variations uh, in the process. I don't think David Cameron is as legalist as you are. <laughs> well, this, well, in the context of the debate of the future of Europe, we can also address his statement on the referendum. I, I think uh, he, in my view, made a similar comment that Tony Blair has done in the context of um, calling the referendum on the Constitution of Europe. I think that the British Prime Minister's occasion when it happens drive after the impression internally to promise referendum. I think luckily, uh, not for Europe, but for Blair, uh, actually the Constitution Treaty did not gain support first in, in France and the Netherlands, and therefore they did not have to call a referendum. Uh, whether in the midst, I think, of 2018, as well as I have calculated, uh, whether he would be in power or not, it's difficult to say, and whether there would be a referendum or not. The, the two of you are following far more closely the British politics, but being someone who follows it for a while, and not from that uh, sort of close perspective, I wonder which uh, British government could win any referendum on any European uh, issue. And the recent results in the Norwegian elections show which party has come to the third place. So I, I think it's delicate, and it's more, more than a Brexit. I think some of the, uh, the European uh, colleagues in the European Parliament are actually speaking about a parking position for the UK, which would assemble to a position that those who do not wish Turkey to become a member have sort of envisaged for Turkey, uh, like a close association type of relationship, which would give it a chance to participate in many policies of when become a full-time member. Uh, however, I think that the European Union as such is much more than the distribution of the budget, which actually when you look at the GDP of the United States is not new at all. And we are all debating uh, in the European Parliament and national governments very extensively and very passionately uh, something that should, in my view, and could be far higher if the European Union wants to be something close to what you have said uh, in terms of a big bank or, or a state in terms of budgetary powers and financial capacity because the way it is today, especially with the current system of uh, collecting or contributing to the EU budget, is I think completely obsolete. Because we we'll always have this debate of who is a net beneficiary, who is a net contributor, and it is a very unhealthy debate. Because you can see it plastically currently when the multi-annual financial framework is being discussed you have a very clear uh, sort of line by the heads of state and government taking account of their national finances and economy, so they won't contribute less and at the same time you see members of the European Parliament from the same parties actually looking at the European project with a different glasses. They have the European optics, they have general interest and they feel that the, the fact that the next financial framework is in absolute terms lower than the previous one is something that can very, very difficult be adequate to match the political priorities and ambitions set out in the Euro 2020 strategy, but also in the new competencies based in the same treaty. So there are, there are many of these uh, elements currently being, uh, being on the agenda. Um, what is the, the Croatian position? Because that is something that is you last. I think that the real debate on Europe is only starting in Croatia. I have to admit that for many years.
yes, but I, I think politically we will only be maturing once we are fully at the table and when our decisions have clear consequences, meaning that we need, we need to stand behind them and not say we, we needed to adapt. So for many years we were sort of following and we were focused on, on, on enlargement, on the key of chapters, etc. Now it's all of a sudden much broader horizon where you need to explain every single policy and what was your point of view. This is something that, that we will um, be witnessing. The Croatian Parliament will discuss in the next few days a new law on the relationship between the government and the parliament on European issues. And that is a novelty in our political system, whereby the government's ministers, and even the prime ministers, would come to the parliament before the European Council, after the European Council, to explain what actually happened. Because you need a sort of a decoding mechanism on the European Council of It's not just a paper that happened overnight. Mm -hmm. It's a document that uh, hundreds uh, of, of experts work on very carefully, and each sentence has its follow-up in legislative exercise later on. And I think this type of substantial debate in Croatia we have not witnessed yet. Chance to live in Belgium and France, and I know what it meant in terms of involvement of all the actors, including academic uh, institutions. And I think we are yet to witness a greater identification of all uh, actors in Croatia who think about Europe in a more certain manner than it was uh, so far. Well, we've concentrated so far almost purely on the economic side of things, but. Um, it seems to me that the EU is functioning possibly even less when it comes to foreign policy issues. Um, and if we're trying to come up with a narrative, because it's because you, you, you talked about that, this new narrative that's going to satisfy the Germans, but at the same time satisfy the Greeks and the Portuguese and the Irish. Um, we obviously do not have the Soviet threat we used to have when the European project was um, beginning. Um, from a foreign policy standpoint, a series of failures, a series of different perceptions when it comes to the role of uh, uh, European policy uh, uh, versus Turkey, versus Russia, versus Ukraine, when it comes to crises such as Syria or Libya and disagreements and the fact that the EU doesn't seem to function properly or at least in a unified fashion uh, in, that, in that area, that strategic conception, how it projects itself even to its immediate neighborhood. What is this new narrative? What is this new grand strategy that could unify us as Europeans? Well, foreign policy is the area where there's been least problems. Despite all the declarations that keep on appearing every few years or every decade, uh, there is no European foreign policy. Now, if you look at the European scene, you basically have two countries that still have some perceptions or illusions of global power, namely Britain and France. You have an economic superpower that still refuses to think in terms of global power, that is Germany. And you have a large number of small actors who think at best about the neighborhood. Okay? It's very difficult to marry and produce a common policy out of that. Uh, and perhaps to add to the previous observation is you have defense budgets that are declining rapidly all over Europe. So that means that already now, and if not now, very soon, virtually all European countries will be incapable of running a military operation outside the own frontier without the strategic help of the United States. That's what we do. Uh, to come up with a European common foreign policy, you need essentially to convince Europeans that in a world which is becoming increasingly multipolar, so the period of unipolarity has lasted over a very short while. Size matters. So unless you have size, you have very little influence. 
And going back to my British friends, because I've spent a large part of my life in Britain, uh, this is where many of the British conservatives live in a cuckoo world. It's the illusion that Britain can actually have a role or influence on its own in the world that is being developed, that is emerging today. I think that the foreign policy will follow economics inevitably. That uh, despite all the talk, this is not going to be the area where we are going to see much change very rapidly, unless we are faced with a huge problem on our doorstep. So it's crisis usually create change, not general designs and strategies. So if there is something dramatically wrong on our doorstep, this may act as a catalyst. But short of that, we will we, we'll all be living in a world of big Switzerland, hoping that somebody else is going to do it. Professor Sokol, I'm sure you have something to respond to. But he's, he's brought up this question of the contrast between the United Kingdom and Germany. One having the illusions of global power, and one being unwilling to take on that role as a leader of, of, of Europe. Um, you obviously believe that Germany is obviously central to, to any possible move forward. Why do you think that it's still so unwilling to take on the leading role? Well, I think it's entirely um, historically driven, um, and it's historically driven in, in two ways. One is the obvious point that you have the experience of uh, the early and mid 20th century, of First and Second World War, particularly of course of Nazism, and a, a strong sense that um, uh, you know Germany doesn't want to be seen to be uh, bullying or, or advancing its own interests, which is why Germans react with complete mystification to the. Um, Cartoons that you see of Chancellor uh, and so on uh, on various European streets, particularly those of the Athens, because Germans simply don't see themselves as, as playing that role. They might even don't, um, or if they do, simply they do it by, by virtue of a, as it were, simply an abstract weight rather than conscious volition. Um, but the, the second aspect, of this brings me back to history, is that before Germany, before 1871, um, Germany you know, obviously didn't exist um, as, a, as a major power in its own right. There were obviously Austria, Prussia, there were individual great powers. And so we have a very long tradition in Germany of um, foreign policy and military restraint, of, of wishing to ignore the threats coming from outside. And those I actually see, that tradition, I actually see as even more dangerous for uh, European foreign policy because what we then see is Germany retreating from the challenges she should be facing, for instance, uh, over Libya, we saw recently where the Germans uh, bailed out and were in the minority. Um, but can I, can I come back to this question of foreign political threats in general? Because it enables me to make a point, again, from history, which is that one of the arguments for the American Union in 1787, um, that's advanced in the Federalist Papers, is that the United States is surrounded on all sides by potentially hostile powers. And the argument is, if we don't have a United States, then how will we persuade people in you know, Rhode Island that the Spaniards in the South might be a problem, and not just the English who are still in Canada? How do we persuade people in the Pennsylvania backcountry that they shouldn't be just worried about the Indians, but they should be worried about, I don't know, the Barbary pirates on the seacoast? How do we persuade people in the Carolinas that they should be worried about uh, the situation in New England. The point being, the only way to persuade Americans to think strategically about the whole was to create a union. So in other words, the narrative, to a certain extent, would come after the fact. And so I think the lesson for us is, the only way you would persuade a Spaniard to think about the security of the Baltic States and Mr. Putin's activities, the only way you would persuade a Pole to think about migration issues in the Mediterranean and whatever, combination you like to think of, is if we have one union, one army, one common security space. Um, and that's got to come first, and the consciousness will follow. Finally, on the question of Britain, um, I'm not English, I'm not even British, so this is not a patriotic statement on behalf of Her Majesty's government. But I think we, we underestimate 
the enduring power of Great Britain, and even in England. I mean, it is a huge country. It's still economically very important. It still has an atomic bomb. It has a representation on the Security Council. All the things that Europeans, as Europeans, don't have. And just to round this off with an anecdote, I was in, in Norway um, a year ago, and they're very worried about the security of the far north. And they also believed that, you know, German power, economic power was the most important. And I asked them, I said, look, if you have a problem with the far north, and you ring Washington, and they say, no, we're no longer interested, uh, we were focusing on the Pacific, who would you then ring? And in the end, they all said, if it was a question of hard military power, they would have no choice but to ring London, possibly Paris, but first London. And, and that gives you a sense. And the deeper the European the Eurozone goes into crisis, the more important, not the less important, that England will become. So I think, I think it's crucial for us to bear this in mind. The, the English are not in trouble. We are in trouble. But it seems that you're, you're at the same time giving them sort of a, uh, an easy out out of a possible uh, um, Eurozone unification. Why is that? Well, because uh, the, what is required in the Eurozone is what the British and the Americans did hundreds of years ago. So in the Eurozone, we've got to play catch up. So that's a simple answer. And in order to, to be what Britain and the United States have been hundreds of years ago, the Eurozone and the European Union has to become something so different that obviously Great Britain can no longer be a part of it. So it won't be a question of Britain leaving the European Union will be part of whatever. It will be that the European Union has left what the European Union has once been. And that's only right and proper. And the vast majority of British people, and certainly the political class, want this to happen. So this is why you have the paradoxical situation, Mr. Osborne saying, go ahead, integrate economically, create the government, you know, secure the Europe. That's in our interest. But we won't be able to follow you in that. That's absolutely right. So, if all this works out according to my plan, you, have, you would end up with another British or another Anglo-American state, but within the Eurozone. And what's the long term about that? Would your job in the European Parliament be easier without the British? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if I can comment, I, in, the, in the years period where I was an observer, I came in just a few years after the British Conservative. Left. And I have to admit, it's, it's a missing link. If you sit in the European Parliament and you try to identify who is who, who has the influence, who is visible, who is not, a group which is now far less visible than it was before, and they were members of the EPP, it's the British Conservatives. And uh, I think they were better off when they were in, when the EPP is better off. Now I wouldn't, I wouldn't comment on that. But if I may just come back to the, to the issue of foreign policy, because it, it has been, let's say, my uh, uh, favorite subject for a number of years, uh, previously as a diplomat. It was in between the lines who, who do we bring in Europe, it was in between the lines whether we have foreign policy or not. I, I think we need to be very realistic and very pragmatic. First of all, I think well, since the Yugoslav crisis in 1991, uh, it has been 22 years. That was your book is called the, the, the Top uh, in French, and uh, the statement of Jacques Poss compared to what the EU has now in terms of instruments in foreign policy, security policy, and defense policy, it's a different institution. It's almost and I think that the key uh, year was 99. The key year was 99 because of uh, the Kosovo crisis and the intervention. And after 99, things, things moved far more uh, concretely in terms of uh, defense policy. It was also after San Malo, French, uh, British Union, etc. So uh, all of the instruments now available on the EU level compared to what they were before can be. Secondly, uh, when you observe foreign policies in big countries, most of you are, are studying these subjects, so I guess you are familiar with a group called the Quint. Uh, those of you who are not, you 
should become aware of it, because the Quint is a group of big countries who have far more closer and regular consultations on everything, and in particular on foreign policy. And when you observe foreign policies of big countries, um, they use the term, at least in Paris, it's a very interesting term, they call it the chantier, which means a construct construction site. So the big countries, they have various construction sites. One is the United Nations, the other one is NATO, the third one is EU, the fourth one is Commonwealth, the fifth one is Francophonie, whatever they have. And their eyes are far more different than the eyes of small and medium-sized countries. They are not living in the same world. They are living in parallel spaces and they operate differently. Because the big countries, they have one huge advantage. And that is the universal presence. If you have a diplomatic network, which usually includes not only diplomats, but experts in economy, finance, and defense issues, intelligence, and they have their own information, their own analysis, and their own set of policy guidelines for any single issue that happens in the world, then they think differently than a country of our size. So what we need to do, because we do not have all of these facilities at our disposal, we need to rely and basically a priori trust what the big ones can sort of analyze and handle the cost. Because we don't have the capacity, nor information, nor enough knowledge of our own. We can have it from second hand, but not the first hand. And this sort of first hand knowledge of foreign policy is exclusive and imminent only to the few countries of the world. And therefore, they will never ever let this privilege that they have sort of to be subordinate compared to the vision of the European policy. That's why we call it effective multilateralism in European security strategy, because this is a very good explanation of how they will operate on the EU foreign policy level, because they understand it's, it's an exercise of many, many layers to the, to the foreign policy. Uh, priorities and activities. Uh, and therefore, uh, Croatia has to be very sober in that sense. Very sober. We were, I think, Catherine Ashton was here a few days ago. And that was a very good novelty for us. We have been many times objects of the of previous uh, holders of that position, but more as an object. Now we come, she comes here and talks to us as a part. She wants to see where we can contribute. So I think we have really uh, passed very well from this object to an actor in terms of the EU foreign policy, but I always reiterate it needs to be very realistic the approach to EU foreign policy. Therefore, the progress I think over the last 20 years, it's, it's incredible. If you look at even the academic literature, really, it's, all, it's all positive, of course, it's not ideal, never be ideal. It seems to me that before we move to, to the questions from the audience, a little bit of summation, um, it seems that we have quite a dosage of uh, realist pessimism from this end of the table, uh, some sort of idealist uh, road forward from this end of the table, and, and another break of realism here from the, from the center, from the political realists who even believe that some things will never ever uh, necessarily change uh, when it comes to great European powers ceding uh, some, um, some of their prerogatives. Now, um, and to conclude our portion here before we turn uh, the floor to you, um, um, I'll end with a quote from one of Professor Tsoukalis' um, articles where you said that for a long time European integration had been like a car moving uphill. The French usually provided the driver, the commission the map, the Germans paid for the petrol, um, and the British oil the brakes. In more recent years, it has looked like a car without a driver, in which the map was replaced by a, by a GPS going on and off, uh, where the Poles insisted on taking out an insurance policy, but God, and nobody wanted to pay for the petrol, uh, with some of them uh, clearly cheating. Um, while those inside the car had an argument about how many more people should fit into the car. Um, so in order to avoid the crash, we desperately needed a capable driver, and some people believe she will have to be a German, uh, at least for the next part of the journey. We also need a GPS that functions, a sense of direction, a minimum of order inside the car, and an agreement about how to share the bill. 
uh, and it is crucial that European integration turns once again into a positive sum game, uh, which has not been for some time. We didn't really provide a sense of how that might happen, we just say that it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, um, but perhaps we can end there for this portion um, and open the floor to questions from the audience. Yes, there's a gentleman over there. Yeah, hi, my name is Dan Aper. I'm a visiting professor here from the United States. Uh, I've got some of my students with me from the U.S. and uh, we're here for a class uh, with Sashem in leadership. And so what I'm seeing here is resistance to change. Okay, to put it in leadership terms, you have an idea uh, for some positive change, European integration. And my question has to do with uh, the motivation uh, that you need to encourage people to join on your effort for change. And, I would, I, would, I would suggest that maybe one possible motivator would be uh, to think in collaborative terms. You always have to think about what's the self-interest of both parties to move in the direction of a collaborative solution. And I guess what I don't get is what is the interest, what is the self-interest of people, particularly in the south of Europe, uh, to enter into European integration? Is, is the resistance based more around uh, patriotism in the sense of, uh, of identity with one's country that might be lost if if it was if it all became one uh, huge United States of Europe, uh, or is it more along the lines of resistance to the economic austerity? Because if it's that, we've got the same problem in the United States. I mean, we have one political party that says we're never going to raise taxes, and another political party that says we're not going to cut social spending, and therefore we have debt. And I think that's maybe similar here. So is, is the holdup, the resistance to change, more along the, the lines of patriotism and a loss of country identity? Or is it uh, fear of austerity? Or is there some other interest that's not being met in the mix here? Thank you very much. <coughs> Anyone in particular, Dan? Or? Anyone in particular you pose a question to? Or? Oh, anyone. Okay. And related to that, I guess, your question coming from your field, are we, are we faced with a lack of leadership at the highest level? Oh, 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 oh. that's a question for me? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that would take hours to answer. You have to go to my class tonight. Um, just, just very briefly, um, I, mean, I think historically speaking, the, the motivation for union integration has always been uh, a question of life and death. So for the Anglo-Scottish Union, you know, uh, getting together, warding off um, French universal monarchy for the Americans, keeping the whole thing together before they were overrun again by Spain, uh, Britain, Barbary Pirates, or they fell out among each other, which was another great fear. Um, and likewise, in the early stages of European integration also, you know, not going back to war, I think it was touched on by some of the previous speakers. And the problem is today, we don't apparently have a threat of life and death, and therefore the, press, the, the, the pressure for integration is, um, is, is lower. Um, however, I think the, the gains are obvious in terms of prosperity coexistence, and I think what they're resisting isn't so much, well obviously they resist austerity, but I think what's really um, getting to people is the sense of, of being excluded democratically, that their vote simply no longer counts. Um, and that decisions have moved to a central level without the democratic legitimation moving with it. Uh, that would be my answer. Um, on leadership, um, I mean, I wrote, for those of you uh, who are interested, I wrote a, a little piece for the London Evening Standard, arguing that um, uh, Angela Merkel would have to be the new European Bismarck uh, and, and to inaugurate some form of uh, union. Um, that process, but even I don't think he's necessarily going to do that anytime soon. Professor Tupper, on this question of leadership perhaps, are you, you speak of these crises that you face, the deficits in Greece, one of them has been a deficit of political leadership as well. Um, do we have a Europe-wide deficit of leadership? Before talking about leadership, I think the driving force so far is a negative one in recent years. And this is the realization by most of us, that if we fail with the euro, much of European integration will go back. And the stakes are very high. And that's what keeps us alive in Berlin, in 
in Athens, in Dublin, and all over the place. So it is the realization that unless, so when we come to the brink, we take the necessary decisions, but they are not enough. For me, if I were to put it again, not slogan terms, but in strong terms, is uh, the key question is how much to, to save the euro to proceed with other The most difficult question is to answer this. <coughs> how much are the Germans prepared to pay? And how much adjustment can or is willing the European South is willing to make? And these are both very difficult questions to answer. And you need a positive answer to both of them to move forward. Now, leadership at this period at the moment can only come from Berlin. And Berlin is like uh, the Shakespearean case that leadership has been thrust upon it without it wanting it, and without knowing what to do with it. And uh, the Franco German leadership that has run the European Federation for decades is not working. Because before, when Sarkozy was president, it was a Franco German uh, sort of Mercosy duo where the Germans set the tone and Sarkozy was trying to catch up. With Hollande, this is not the case. So now there is a vacuum because there is German leadership to the extent that there is leadership, but that can't change. And that sort of situation is dangerous politically for Europe. It should not last for long because it's going to be a boomerang effect in the rest of Europe. I mean, we all have, I think, a strong interest in having the French back at the table playing with the Germans. Because Germany on its own is not good for Germany and it's not good for the rest of Europe. If I may just comment on, on your uh, notion of resist to change. Coming from Croatia, perhaps the change is the key word that we've been sort of living for the last 23 years. If you came here in 1990 and compared it to Croatia today, I think change would be the only message you would retain to take, to take back to the US. What's happening with us today is, the, first of all, the transition from the socialist times, from being a public, being a sort of uh, society with uh, the Communist Party and the Union and Socialists without real pluralism into where we are today, uh, 23 years later, multi-party system, member of NATO, member of the European Union, uh, uh, market economy. I wouldn't say that the transition was without uh, difficulties or mistakes. On the contrary, in today's Croatia is where perhaps lacking its full preparedness in a sense exactly because we made some mistake, mistakes in the times of privatization. There were a lot of things which did not happen properly. Uh, but the change was actually the positive thing here. What is delicate for Croatia, we are entering into the European Union alone. It happens first time after Greece in 1981. So the fact that you, when you're entering alone, it's a very simple morale. You're not a priority. That was a huge problem of ours. You know, when the tenth were joining together, they were a big political priority. Everybody was talking about enlargement because you feel like ten heads of state, ten ministers lobbying all the time. The issue was there. Then the two leftover countries were there and Armenia. And then there was this crisis, there was the enthusiasm for enlargement, fatigue, problems with absorption, etc. etc. And we really had to do unimaginable diplomatic efforts in order to remain in the focus of the European leaders and join in this very unfavorable context. So therefore, from a, from a Croatian point of view, the change will continue, especially in the first years of membership. And our delicate problem is that, that we come into the EU when the general atmosphere is full of issues totally unrelated with us and us not being part of the solution in the sense that we can solve it. So we need to adapt in many ways, adapt to the, the current debates in the EU of like what is our future at the topic of our agenda and plus how can we sort of swim in that very complicated swimming pool.
as of 1st of July. Um, other questions? Yes. Hello everyone, my name is Anna Bovic, I work at the SHIM. Uh, first of all, thank you for the fruitful discussion. Um, now, as regards the question to save the euro, do we need a state or do we give up the currency? I think that, uh, that is actually not the proper question and I think we left out uh, at least two important remarks. First of all, um, I think we're taking for granted this notion of the EU membership. I don't think that there is such a thing as a, un thing as a uniform notion of an EU membership. I think. Um, that now we have a variety of multi-leveled EU membership. First the Eurozone, then the Schengen Zone, uh, then the Brits themselves, and then the negotiating powers of, of each of the member states itself. So this is something that maybe we have left out um, in talking about the future narrative of Europe. Uh, the second thing is that I think that we're forgetting that there is not just a clear dichotomy between this Europe EU as a state-like organization, or the EU as an international organization where each country has a veto. Now, I think what is the biggest strength of Europe is that they have a qualified majority voting. Um, the only problem is that they don't have this institutional absorption capacity that happened in, what happened in 2004 with the big enlargement. Um, you can't really control the decision-making process anymore with so many member states. So what my proposal would be is actually to change the way the decisions are actually made on the EU level um, but I do think that there is a remarkable um, advantage in the fact that there is a new institutional momentum on the EU level, which is neither state-like nor an, uh, an international organization-like, that can actually provide for decisions at the EU level. So I think that the solution is actually to find a new solution for the qualified majority voting with such a big EU. This question of the EU being different things to different member states, I mean, formally and also informally, that is an important one. Um, Brenda, would you like to answer that? Yes, thank, thank you. You're, you're absolutely right. And we should have um, probably said a bit more about that. Um, from my point of view, uh, the creation of a single Eurozone state would then sort those problems out. And in other words, it would either fall on this side of the line or on the other. And while I take your point that uh, at one level, this variety may be a strength. What we've been seeing is that the things that really matter, foreign policy, the currency, and so on, it's a weak, so it's precisely the problem we're trying to address. On QMV, well, under my system, the QMV would be the parliamentary votes of the entire union. So that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be something that, um, I would see some form of revised QMV simply as delaying you know, the ultimate outcome of the union. There is no state-like will uh, among the member states. Well, well I, think, I, think that they will, I think they will discover that state-like will when they contemplate the alternative. And the alternative is not only the chaos that we've seen, the economic aspect, but also the fact that if the question of Germany and how Germany is embedded in larger homes is not addressed, we will then have one, and we already have, one very large national state, which where the likes of one becomes dominant. And as uh, Lucas Tukalis says, neither the Germans don't like it and other people don't like it. And therefore, embedding it all in one larger state is the only way around it. So, uh, none of the current solutions seem to have actually worked. We had another question. Yes. Uh, my name is Shorty Wiesner. I am an MD student uh, from Zagreb School of Economics and Management. Uh, we had another uh, meeting, I mean, a conference, where an expert from the Nomura uh, organization, if I'm not wrong, uh, explained how Eurozone crisis should be looked into as uh, a balance sheet recession, uh, as uh, experienced by Japan uh, uh, for the last uh, two decades and recently by the USA. Uh, in terms of being able to solve the problem, uh, looking into it in that manner. Uh, and uh, he expressed doubts uh, in uh, the European Union being able to solve this uh, Europe uh, crisis effectively 
uh, within the scopes of the unified monetary or fiscal policy because of the differences of the uh, economies of the member states. So, my question would be, uh, uh, would you uh, propose a selective uh, method or approach for solving the Eurozone crisis in different member states uh, or not? Thank you. Yeah, I meant the professor. Yeah. Uh, well, in a monetary union, monetary policy has to be one size fits all, by definition, because monetary policy is centralized, and monetary policy is decided by the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. Although increasingly we realize that even with respect to monetary policy, there may have to be measures that address the problem in specific countries. I give you an example. The European Central Bank decides the interest rate. That is for everybody. But because of the crisis, the market, the banking union, has been fragmented. So if you are a medium-sized enterprise in Italy, you borrow at a much higher rate of interest and a corresponding medium-sized enterprise in Germany. Not because of the inherent characteristics of the company, but because you have an Italian plant. And that means that the monetary union has been partially fragmented. So the European Central Bank is now thinking in terms of taking specific measures to deal with this fragmentation to therefore provide more liquidity to parts of the monetary union that have this specific problem. There's a capital risk. Okay? And therefore, Italy is not Arizona, because nobody thinks that Arizona may leave the, the, European, the, the American monetary union. But some, some people may still think that Italy may leave. So that makes a difference. Uh, now, on fiscal policy, fiscal policy remains largely a national Affair. You have more coordination, but still fiscal policy is largely determined by national capital because that's where most of the money, the budget is. So we are only talking about closer coordination and constraints, but still a rather decentralized operation. We are trying to reconcile those two things. It is not easy. Uh, I mean, there is the experience of Japan which has gone through a 20-year period of recession. And the experience of Japan would have been even much worse, because remember that the Jap Japanese sovereign debt is more than 200% of Japanese GDP. This is worse than any country in the European Union or the United States. This continues as long as Japanese households are prepared to lend the Japanese government at close to zero rate of interest. If one day more and more Japanese households wake up and realize that there are better alternatives, then the Japanese government will be in deep trouble. That's it. Perhaps one more question to Barry. Yes. Well, my name is Anton Uwich, and I work at the Institute for Development and International Relations as I work. So, um, my question for you, Mr. Sims. Um, when I was walking into this conference room, I sort of expected to, to get a, a clear answer of what was going to be the future of Europe. And uh, we, we see that Europe is really in bad shape. And for the first time in history, we see that the support for the European project is dwindling. And this reflection period, the pondering period about the future of the European Union has been going on for five or six years, and the European economy is getting it at a, a worse and worse shape. And uh, the problem is we, we can't see the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel. So, uh, so my question for you is, we've got, I think, my, perce my perception is we've got three options to solve this big problem. So the, the first option is to create a multi-tier Europe. So we've got the periphery, so we've got countries like Greece and Germany, they've, they've got nothing in common. 
So there's no way we can compare or draw any parallel between the United States of America and Europe. So it's a, it's a multi-tier Europe. Or the second option is we're going to spaghetti bowl with a, with a number of opt-outs and then we decide what we want to do. So, uh, like, for example, the Brits, they, they always tend to go for the opt-outs. Uh, so, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So, uh, it, it, do you perceive there's an option for that sort of Europe? Uh, with really, really diverse countries with, uh, with, with the will to do what they want. Or, like, the third option is to create a superpower, which is nothing like the United States, but, but with, with the, with the Franco-German axis at the center, at the core. And, of course, my question for you is, since you come from Ireland and, and you're, you're a British neighbor, what's, where do you perceive the role of Great Britain? We, now we see David Cameron ta tabling the, 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 the referendum bill. So, what do you think? What do you make of it? Are the Brits going, going to, to step out of the European Union, or they're getting more into the, at the core of, of the European integration? So, we've got three options, and, and what do you think that the solution is? Thank you. Goodness, <laughs> that's quite a question. Um, I mean, I can't give you the clear answer you quite rightly would like to have, because I'm a historian and not a prophet. Um, so, um, but in terms of the, the choices you've presented, I mean, I think the difficulty with the multi-tier Europe, which is something that certain elements in German politics are uh, experimenting with, at least rhetorically, is that um, it would then have the effect, on the one hand, of reducing the overall number of states in that closer union, and therefore increasing the relative weight of Germany, which would then reduce the attractiveness of the project to many people. <coughs> Secondly, you would then be left with the problem of what you do with those who are left out. And so Greece could turn out to be a success story where it simply becomes a, you know, an area of cheap tourism, innovation, and so on. Or it could become a disaster zone which lapses into some form of nationalism, picks fights, or has fights picked with it by Slavic neighbors, or with the Turks, or is bought out by the Chinese, or whatever. Um, so we're going to have to think about the future of those areas as Europeans, even if they're no longer within our, our, um, our union. And so I think it's much simpler, if at all possible, to keep them in the union uh, to start with. As far as option B, spaghetti bowl, well, to a certain extent, that's what we have. Um, and for the foreseeable future, we'll, we'll be stuck with. Um, on the question of whether one would go forward some kind of superpower based around a Franco-German axis, um, I think that uh, Lucas was making the point that, that that model has come unstuck because French relative power has declined so much and German relative power has increased. And that's precisely the problem we're dealing with. On Great Britain, what I've already said, I, mean, I think that European, the Eurozone is waking up to the fact that what it needs is a single state to go with a single currency. And the minute they've finally completed that project, um, there will then be the question of what happens with Great Britain. And Great Britain will not be part, it will not lose its sovereignty in this new state. And therefore, if it were a condition of remaining in the European Union, uh, it would then leave uh, quite, quite properly, I think. Well, indeed, we did not provide you with clear answers, with clear prophecies of what the future of Europe is going to be. Um, but I hope we gave you some sense, a little bit more than just the pessimism of the current moment, perhaps some views of possibilities, endless possibilities for our future, hopefully some of them positive. Um, so please join me in uh, thanking our speakers.